So the title, the title of the series is Living Life Beyond Regret. Living Life Beyond Regret. I'm going to ask you to just say that out loud. Say, say living life beyond regret. And now let, let's say it as a declaration, as a prayer. Just, just say, I, I want to live life beyond regret. I want to live life beyond regret. And so today's subtitle is Mistakes and Missed Opportunities. I want to talk about mistakes. I want to talk about dealing with mistakes. How do we deal with that? How do we process it? And this sense of missed opportunities. Now, I defined regret last week as a feeling of sorrow for something that has happened. Uh, So it can be a disappointment, something tragic, something disappointing, a loss that has happened. Uh, But it includes mistakes, failures. Every one of us have failed. Every one of us have made mistakes. We've experienced losses. And we've all experienced uh, missed opportunities, things that... That, that we think, oh, I, I should have done or I, I could have done. We'll often say it this way, or at least I certainly say it this way, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Or I shouldn't have said that. Does anybody else ever go through that in their mind? And, and if I pull the curtain back and I'm really real with you and vulnerable, I, I actually go through this. I, I'm growing, but I go through this all the time. And I'm trying to grow. I, I haven't arrived yet, but the train's left the station. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to grow through this. Uh, but, but I go through that in my mind. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or why did I say that? Why did I say it that way? Or, or did that person, did they understand what I, what I was saying? And so we often do that. Uh, sometimes we'll say it this way. I can't believe that I did that. Uh, when I look back on the foolishness, as a young person, some of the things that I said and did, I, I just regret. But you can't go back and, and change the past. You can't go back and, and take away those words or take away those actions. On, on the other side, we, we often say this, I should have invested. Wow, when the internet came out, I wish I would have known where and how to invest. I wish I would have known uh, to invest in some of the big companies uh, before they, they took off, but you, you, couldn't, you couldn't predict it. And so we think, oh, I should have bought that stock. Uh, sometimes it's, it's something like, I, I, should have, I should have taken that job. What would my life been like if I would have taken that job, if I would have moved overseas, if I would have moved to another state? Uh, we go through those, those feelings and that sense of, wow, that was an amazing opportunity, uh, but maybe we just weren't sure about it. In our present circumstances, we prayed, we did our best, but oftentimes we'll, we'll go through that. Thing, uh, all kinds of things. You might say, "Well, I should have tried out for the NFL." Some of you might have had the potential. I should, I should have kept in shape. Why didn't I stay in shape? Why didn't I keep exercising? Why didn't I keep running? It, it's certainly hard to get to get back on on track. Now, I want to put up on the board here, and I, I think we have this in the notes, don't we? Here's an American saying. Here's an American saying, and and I. I think it's an American saying, but we say this all the time. You can be anything that you want to be. And I know what we mean by that. It it sounds very positive and encouraging. I'm just not sure it's biblical. Because if we're really honest, I mean, you can be anything you want to be. I know why we say that, but but I, I, I can't play in the NFL. I couldn't when I was 20, and I certainly could not now. I know what we mean by this, but I think it's more of an American saying. You can be anything that you want to be. I'm going to give you a more biblical saying, and it's simply this. You can be anything God wants you to be. When God says that he wants you to do something, he'll give you the grace, the capacity, the wherewithal, the power, the ability. He'll give you the training to do it. So when God says that you're going to do something or you're going to be something, that is plausible. That is possible. That is is doable. Now, we think about our lives, and we often go through regret. And the more I walk with the Lord and the more I minister, the more I realize probably every single person sitting here struggles with regret, struggles with playing things over in our mind. Why did that happen? Why didn't it happen? Why did I say that? Why didn't I say that? Why did I do that? I should have done that. I shouldn't have done this. I should have. I could have. I would have. Those are very human things. But what I want to challenge us on today 
is that God really wants us to grow past that. He really doesn't want us to be limited or paralyzed by those thought processes. And so we get angry and frustrated with ourselves, and we get angry and frustrated about our past, about the things that have happened. So I want to say this at the outset, and I really believe this is the word of the Lord, and I hope that you'll receive this into your heart today. God is not angry or frustrated about your past. And, and I believe that's more than me just uh, preaching or teaching that. I, I believe that that is prophetic, that God is not angry or frustrated about your past. I might be angry and frustrated and disappointed about my past. But God is not nervous about it. He's not frustrated about it. And he's not given up on me. Say amen to that. That's really, really important. Now, here's the, the, the scripture I just want us to have in mind. This is Psalm 103, verses 13 to 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And so think about, as a parent, how much compassion, how much love that you have for your children. Now multiply that by millions and billions of times, and we might get a little glimpse of God's love and compassion for us, but just a glimpse, because His love is, is infinite. But He has, has compassion on us like a father has compassion on, on their children. And this is an important part of the verse. He remembers that you're dust. He remembers your humanity. He remembers your imperfection. I'm the one that struggles with my my imperfection, God's not worried about it. God's not, God's not concerned about it. He knows that he formed us from dust, and he knows that, that we're imperfect. Now, I think what will help us with this, and, and I've used this illustration in slightly different ways in different messages, but I think this will help us. God sees our life from the beginning to the end. It's not by accident that he refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He sees your life from the beginning, and he sees it at the end. He sees the whole thing. You're stuck in the middle, but he sees the beginning and the end. And so I think that the, the best way to visualize this is that you're on a journey, and you're on a train. Now, on that train, if you're in the middle of a car with a, with a whole bunch of cars, the locomotives at front, the cabooses at the back, but you're on a train, what do you see when you're in the middle? Let's pull up this visual because this, this picture here, it, it shows that this is all that you see. You can't, no, nope, the other one. The, uh, this is all you see right here. The, the, so you can only see, and notice this, as a human, you can't see the front and the back at the same time. And you might have pretty good peripheral vision, but you're going to have to look forward, lean out the window, or you're going to have to look back and lean, see the back. So you're either looking forward or you're looking back. That's really all that you can do. You, you can't really look at both at the same time. You can look at the back, appreciate it, and then look forward. But as a human, you're, you're stuck in the middle of your journey. But now the next picture, this is how, this is how God sees it. So God sees the beginning and the end. So you're in a car, all kinds of things are happening. Now, I want this visual to be in, in our mind today while I'm, I'm teaching this, while I'm preaching this. And then as we go to ministry time to say, you know what? God knew what was going to happen. He knew where I was going. He knew where he was taking me. And he saw the beginning and the end. And he can meet me in this moment to heal my heart so I'm not distracted and paralyzed by the past, but I can be forward thinking and looking toward the future. And so let's talk about our, our, our mistakes. Let's talk about missed opportunities. Now, now two things that I, I just want to drill down on today is that we really have to believe what Jesus did and we have to believe who Jesus is. What Jesus did and, and who he is and that we really need to invite him to minister to us wherever we are in our journey. And so we're going to find out that the Lord can touch us in our present, but he touches us in our past because he knows exactly where we're going in the future. Say amen to that. So what, what do we believe? We believe what Jesus did. 
So the first thing is this. My brother and sister, we've got to really believe God's grace and forgiveness. We really have to internalize, believe God's grace and forgiveness. Now, we've, most of us have memorized John 3, 16 here. And sometimes when you memorize a, a passage, it can either do something deeper in you or because you've said it so many times, you've missed it. So, so look at John 3, 16. Let's pull it up on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we need to really look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Do you believe in Jesus today? Everybody say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer, okay? So I believe. So I need to really receive God's love and his forgiveness in my life. Verse 17 and 18 are extremely important in the context. That you are not condemned by your past mistakes or your missed opportunities. You might condemn yourself. You might repeat those things in your mind over and over. In fact, we punish ourselves by reliving the mistakes. God wants to heal our heart. Give us grace to truly let go of the past so that we can enjoy today and enjoy tomorrow. He really wants to do that. But yet we punish ourselves and we condemn ourselves. So hear the word of the Lord. And it might need to be a, a prayer that you, you, you pray into. And it might be your journey and walk with the Lord to say, God, I really want to break through this thing in my life where I don't feel so condemned about the things that have happened, the things that I've said, the mistakes that I've experienced. And so you got to go to the Lord. you got to have that encounter with him. Now, Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Again, most of us have this memorized, but look at it with your eyes and ask the Lord to let it thunder in your heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So when you came to Christ, maybe you were five years old. Maybe you were so little you don't even remember the day that you prayed to receive Jesus. Maybe it was when you were adult and you really felt that sense of being a new creation. But regardless of when you prayed and gave your heart to the Lord, you are a new creation, brand new. If we had time, we would talk about the fact that you were born again. You're a new person. You've received a new nature. And so you're a new creation. Now, don't miss the next part of the verse. The old is gone. <laughs> Let's say it out loud. Say, the old has gone. Let's say it again. The old has gone. So if I really believe that, and I don't always, and I'm sure you don't always, but if I really believe that the old has gone, it's, it's done. It's finished. It's gone. It's in my past. But what I do, and I think most of us do, is we keep looking back as though it's there. Some of you maybe have more grace in this area. But the old is gone. Now watch this. The new has come. Let's say it out loud. The new has come. The new has come. Okay. So that's, that's really important. So I have to really pray, God, help me to receive your love, your grace, your forgiveness. Now, Romans 8, verse 1, most of us have it memorized as well. And verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you've received his love, there's no condemnation. If you're born again, you're a new creation. You have a new nature. There is no condemnation. So who condemns? The devil. Evil spirits condemn us. And we condemn ourselves because we keep repeating the mistakes and we punish ourselves by revisiting those things in the past. So please say this out loud. There is no condemnation. Nation. Say, no condemnation. Now, I, I don't have time to teach on this, but, but condemnation in the Scripture really means to push down and to smother. That's what condemnation is. Just the opposite of freedom in Christ. 
So when the enemy condemns, what he's trying to do is contain you, smother you, push you down, limit you, paralyze you, put you in this prison of pain. That's condemnation. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I, I wish I had time to teach on it, but suffice it to say today, there is no condemnation. That's not the heart of the Father. And Jesus, if I really believe what he did and what he accomplished for me, then I have to embrace this fact. There is no condemnation. So now I'm going to talk to the mature for a moment. Everyone say, I'm mature in the Lord. Okay? So if, I'll personalize it, if I am listening to the devil's condemnation and my own condemnation of myself then I really have not received God's grace and forgiveness. And so I, I, I need a revelation of that. I need that desperately in my life because I have to believe truth more than my feelings and even more than my thought patterns. Okay, so let's say it is a, a prayer. Say, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus, okay? So again, God is not angry or frustrated about your past. You might be, I might be frustrated with my past, but God is certainly not. So the first thing is I got to believe God's grace and forgiveness. The second thing is believe the blood. Believe the blood that was shed for you. Listen to 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, he, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So the blood of Jesus purifies you today of every mistake, every thought pattern. Uh, listen to Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? So the blood of Jesus washes. The blood of Jesus cleans. The blood of Jesus uh, it takes all those stains away, the residue. you, you got to have an encounter with the Lord and let the blood of Jesus, imagine it as just something filthy that's being washed and, and clean. And that's exactly what the blood of Jesus does. He comes and he, he cleanses and he, he, he purifies and he cleans all of those, those inner recesses of your mind and the repetition of the mistakes or the missed opportunities that we have. So the blood of Jesus does that for us. You know what Revelation 1 and verse 5 says? Jesus loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. It's his blood, the blood of Jesus. So if we truly love the Lord, if we really love the Lord, then we're going to receive his grace and forgiveness, and we're going to believe the blood of Jesus. May I submit to you that if we're not really receiving this, then we're not really understanding the power of his blood and applying that forgiveness and that cleansing to our life. So we have to receive, believe God's grace and forgiveness, believe the blood shed for us. Thirdly, we have to believe in today and tomorrow. You got to believe in today and tomorrow. Listen to Philippians 3 and verses 13 and 14. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I went to a small high school, and in the yearbook, we each got a page, and we could put pictures and things that we were involved in, and so I, I did that, and I chose a verse, and I chose this verse. Little did I know how precious and how meaningful and how much I would need this verse in my life, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward, toward the goal, toward the prize, to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so it takes courage to forget what is behind and to press on. God's wanting to give us grace to forget what is behind and to press on. It's this picture of a race, of running a race with the Lord. And so I want to invite you to go to Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, we often read this verse and we think about the sin. We focus on the sin and we say, okay, well, I'm not, there isn't any gross sin in my life or, or anything. I know we all struggle with different things, but, but we focus on that. But what I want to focus on today is right where it says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And what I want to submit to you is what hinders us from running our race is revisiting our mistakes and missed opportunities in our life. And it actually ends up paralyzing you. It actually ends up entangling you. Uh, yeah, the sin that entangles, but, but so does this sense of, uh, of dwelling on the past. And so if we're going to run our race, the Lord is saying to us today, you know what, I don't want you to focus on the past that's going to entangle you. I want you to throw that off. That is the everything that hinders. Your, your missed opportunities, your mistakes, that hinders you from running. And so the Lord is saying to us today, don't, let's not let that, let's not let it hinder us uh, from running. Now, I want you to just take note of this word wait. You see that there? It says, let us throw off everything that hinders it's like, a, it's like a weight. So, so the sin can entangle you, but this everything is like a weight, a weight that you carry, a, a weight that you're trying to run with. If you were going to run a race, you wouldn't want to carry 100 pounds while you're running that race. Uh, and so you, you dress for that. You, 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 you wear the right shoes. You, you run the race uh, to be as unhindered as possible. But most of us have been running this race for the Lord with this huge weight of our conscience, of our past mistakes. And the Lord is saying, take off that weight, that, that everything that, that hinders, everything that, that entangles. So I want to invite you to go to Romans chapter 5. So I want you to think about this, this idea of, of weight. Listen to Romans 5 and verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this word glory is the Greek word doxa, but it, it, it means certainly the radiance of God and everything. But if you take it back, to the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory was kabod. And kabod meant a heavy weight. And so when we talk about the glory of the Lord, if the God's glory moves in this place, there's this sense of heaviness. There's a sense of, of his weight. You can feel his presence. And so unfortunately, most of us have had the weight of sin or the weight of our past conscience or the weight of the mistakes that we have done. God's saying, take off that and embrace instead my glory, which is a different kind of weight. It's his presence. It's his peace. It's his power. And so the Lord wants us to, to have that weight, to get rid of the other weight and, and to encounter uh, his glory. So I, I'll say it this way. Let's lay aside the weight of guilt and the past, and let's have an encounter with the weight of God's glory right now in this moment. So I have to believe in today and tomorrow. Said another way, if I'm focusing on the past, I'm carrying the weight of my mistakes and the weight of the past. But if I'm focusing on today and tomorrow, I'm carrying the weight of His glory. So I want to submit to you that I think we have less room for His glory. I could say it this way. Less room for His glory if I'm carrying the weight of condemnation and the weight of my mistakes and the weight of my own self-condemnation. I lay that aside. I can have the encounter. I have room for the, for the glory of God to manifest in my life. Say amen to that. So do you want to live big? I want to live big. How do you live big? Say goodbye to the past. You want to live with joy? I want to live with joy. Embrace your present. Embrace now. Instead of looking back, oftentimes we look back 
in the past, we regret things so much that we're missing out on the blessing and the joy of the now. May God give us the grace to embrace our now, to embrace our present, to not be so focused on the past. Listen, many people are so focused on the past and so worried about the future that they're messing up the present. And God wants you to enjoy the present. He wants you to enjoy. So embrace the now in your life. Count your blessings now. Look around and say, what is God doing now? Instead of looking back over your shoulder, say, God, I want to live in the present. I want to live the now. And how do you live without limits? Do you want to live without limits? You look to the future. Because if you look to the past all the time, you're going to miss out on the promises that God has for you. Say amen to that. And so we have to realize and believe what Jesus did. Secondly, today, I just want to underscore this, that we have to believe who Jesus is. Got to really believe who he is. Number one, Jesus heals. Remember the prophetic messianic passage in Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment of your sins was truly on Jesus. But yet you punish yourself all the time. Jesus already took the punishment. But yet you punish yourself. You know, I should pause and give you a footnote. There are some people that are very cavalier about their sin. Like it's no big deal. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about you today. I'm talking about what we do. What I do is sometimes we punish ourselves over and over with the the mistakes. I'm talking to the mature today. I'm not talking to the immature that are cavalier about their sin as though it's no big deal. But what we tend to do is we we punish. But Jesus took the punishment. If I'm going to be mature in the Lord, if I'm going to really believe what Jesus said, then I have to believe that he took the punishment for my mistake and even my missed opportunities. So why do I keep punishing myself? And by his wounds, we are healed. (laughs) I'm healed. Now, now, Now watch this, the next verse. We all like sheep. We all like sheep. You know, when the Bible calls you a sheep, I don't have time to get in this, into this, but it's not a compliment. I know they have a woolly little lamb, and, 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 and they're, but sheep are kind of dumb. And that's a whole other message, and I hope you'll still come back next week after having said that. But it's not a big compliment. But notice this, we all like sheep. We've gone astray. We wander. We we, we, we wander around. We we lose our bearings. We lose our our thought processes. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we tend to wander. We tend to get off track. We tend to to lose focus. That's what a sheep does. Now, mirror that to the Scripture in 1 Peter 2.24, where he reflects and, and quotes Isaiah, Peter says it this way, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And we often stop there, but look at the next verse. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your soul. So we're all like sheep. We're all like sheep. We forget who we are. We forget how blessed we are. We, we forget how remarkable we are. We forget the benefits that God has given. We focus on the past instead of enjoying the now and the future. But I'm here to declare to you today that Jesus heals. And he wants to heal the memories. And he wants to heal and take away the torture in your mind of the past mistakes. Of the things that have happened. Of the, of the missed opportunities. Of why did I say that? Why didn't I say this? Why why did I find, I can't believe I found myself in that relationship. I can't believe that this happened to me. I can't believe I didn't take that job. And on and on it goes. The Lord wants to heal you from those things so you can enjoy the present and move on. Jesus heals. Somebody say that. Say Jesus. Jesus heals. The second thing is this. Jesus restores. Please say that out loud. Say Jesus restores. Someone say, he's a restoring God. 
Come on, pinch your neighbor and say, He restores. He, he restores. Now, now, now watch this, Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Watch this, watch this, watch this. He restores my soul. He restores. So, so God is a restoring God. So hear the word of the Lord today. If you missed an opportunity, it's okay. He's big. He'll give you another opportunity. <laughs> if you didn't buy that stock, I guarantee you another one's coming around. If you didn't buy the house and you thought, oh, I missed out on interest rate, it doesn't matter. God's still going to give you a house. Say amen to that. Amen. And if you missed the relational opportunity or you felt like you blundered and you messed up, hear the word of the Lord. God heals and he restores. And you're sitting next to a whole bunch of people that have been through loss and restoration. And if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. He's a restoring God. Say it out loud. Say he, he's a restoring God. He's a you got to get hold of this scripture in Joel 2.25. This one's for you. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. So i got a word for you today that if things have been lost, if the devil has stolen from you, stolen relationships, stolen finances, stolen your peace, stolen your joy, hear the word of the Lord. God will repay. God will restore. God will give back that which has been Lost. Shout amen to that. Amen. Years, years, years that the locusts may have eaten. Years that maybe you have gone through of loss. Years. God says, I'll restore it. And, and something I found out about the Lord, He's so good, so restorative, that the recovery time is phenomenal. And so what might have taken you 10, 20 years in the past because he's healed and restored you and you learned a lot of things along the way, a lot of hard knocks. When he begins to restore, there's exponential release of his blessing and power in your life. Oh, glory to Jesus. Oh, glory to Jesus. That's your verse. I'll repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. That's why Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 9. Our prayer is, is that you may be fully restored. My prayer for you is that you'll be fully restored in your marriage, in your family, with your health, with your finances, with your ministry, fully restored. Not, not a little bit, not partially, fully restored. Even if you can't wrap your brain around it, even if you don't fully understand it, God's healing comes and his restorative power is released in your life. So number, the first part of this, Jesus heals. Say that out loud. Jesus heals. Secondly, Jesus restores. Say that, Jesus restores. And the third one is this, Jesus is I am. Jesus is I am. Exodus 3, verse 14. Moses has this encounter in the burning bush. God says, I want you to lead the Israelites out of bondage, he says, well, who, who, who can I tell him is sending me? I need some authority. I need somebody backing me. And God reveals his name to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. We fast forward into the New Testament. Jesus steps on the scene as the son of God. And in the garden, or rather uh, in an encounter with the Pharisees, they are asking him who he is, and listen to what Jesus says. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. So God meets Moses in the burning bush, says, I am. Jesus says, I am. If you read the rest of the text, they were so angry about that, they considered it blasphemy that they were going to stone him. It says Jesus slipped away and, and, he, and he got away. But what Jesus was saying is he was God. What Jesus was saying is he was Yahweh. He was the great I am. Now, hear the word of the Lord. God wants you and me to embrace the fact that he is Yahweh. He is the God I am. He's the God of the now. Okay? He's not just the God of the past. He's not the God of the future of what's going to happen. He's God right now. I am right now. That's what he was saying. I am. Moses, I am for you. I am always 
present in your life. Now apply this to our message. So instead of saying this, I was, you need to say, I am. Instead of saying, I made that mistake, or I can't believe I said that, I can't believe, you, you need to say, I am. I am forgiven. I am accepted. I am a child of God. I am successful. Instead of saying what you were or what you thought you were, say, I am. I am a child of God. I am forgiven. There is no condemnation. I am who God says I am. I am. He is the I am, and I am His child. He is the I am, and I am forgiven. He is the I am, and I am successful. I don't think you understand. So instead of saying, instead of saying this, instead of saying this, I, I, I shoulda, woulda, coulda, instead of saying I coulda been, I need to say I can be a good husband. I can be a good father. I can do my job. I can minister in signs and wonders. I can, I can. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.19. I can do it. And so that is embracing God as the I am. <laughs> so I don't want to look to my past so much and beat myself up that I miss out on today and tomorrow. Today, He's the I am. So I'm here to tell you today, God, God wants to meet you now in the I am. Embrace the now. Embrace the great I am. It's not for tomorrow. It's now. It's going to heal you now. It's going to touch you now. It's going to have an encounter with Him now. It's going to heal the memories now. It's going to help you lay aside the weight now as you have an encounter with His glory, His weight now. You can lay aside the weight now so that you can run this race now, so that you can move to your future now, so that you can see that your promise is better than your past now. It's not. He's the I am. Say amen to that. And so the, the, the prayer is, is that we would live beyond regret. We'd live a life beyond regret. I, I, I feel like I need to, to just bring this to a close. And so I want to I wanna demonstrate this and illustrate this by, by looking at two texts. And I, I want you to, to lean in and, and, and take time to just put an exclamation point on this, okay? And then we're going to go to prayer, but I want you to think in terms of God looking at the train. He's looking at the train, seeing the beginning and the end. But when you're messed up in the middle, you feel so frustrated and, and angry, and you repeat over and over in your heart and, and in your mind. And, and so I want to illustrate this by, by just looking at the life of, of Peter. And I'm going to, I'm going to bookend his life. I'll tell you how he was called. You're, you're going to see how he was called. And then we're going to look how, after all the mistakes, how, how God restored him. So, so look at Luke chapter 5, or, or listen on as I, as I read this. And, and I, I could summarize it, but I want to let the Scripture do the talking. I want to let God's Word do the talking. So in Luke 5 and verse 1, it says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Galilee... With the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, now listen to Simon Peter's response. He's a professional fisherman. The rabbi tells him to go out into the water and to, to fish a little longer. Uh, so, so Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. He knows what he's doing. He's a professional commercial fisherman. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. So with a sigh, he's like, all right, I'll do it. So he goes and does it. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Peter saw this, 
He fell at his, Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. There's so much I could say here, but what happens here is because of the miracle, because he sighed, because he didn't really want to believe it, because he did it anyway, it revealed who he was and it revealed who Jesus was. How many people have ever done that where you are beating yourself up, you're going through these things, you don't really believe God, then God actually comes through and you're like, Lord, I am so sorry that I didn't believe you about that situation. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, for from now on you will catch men. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. What an amazing event. And then we begin to follow the life of Peter. He gets to see Jesus open blind eyes. He gets to see cripples walk. He gets to see Jesus bring people back to life. And then Jesus tells them that he's going to go to the cross. And Peter, in his impetuousness, and came out of a good desire, but he says to, to Jesus, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, Jesus, you're not going to lie. And Jesus says to him, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And, and so Peter uh, says to Jesus, even if others never deny you, I, or even if others deny you, I will never deny you. And you remember the story. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, before the... Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. You'll deny me three times. It's exactly what happened. And then the Bible says this, that Peter, when he denied Christ, he went outside and he wept. So if anyone struggled with regret, it had to have been Peter. How could he have denied the Lord? He walked with him. He saw miracles. He was, he was in his inner circle, and yet he, he denies the Lord. And so then Jesus says to them, after I rise again, I'm going to go to Galilee and you come and find me. And so they go to Galilee and then we see the restoration. And this is found in John chapter 21 on Peter's restoration. And it says this in verse 15. And this, I, I wish I had time to, to, to describe this whole thing. But what Peter does, oh, let's read it. So good. Keep looking at the clock. Look to your neighbor and say, forget the clock. Yeah. Say, it's anointed. Say, it's anointed. Okay. All right. Look at this. Verse, tw verse 1 of John chapter tw 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now, notice this. Peter says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, I can, I can imagine all kinds of things here. The emotion, the frustration, where is Jesus? All right, I'm just going to go and fish. They, they fish all night. Remember Luke chapter 5. They don't catch anything. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, I'm sure they're thinking this, this sounds a little familiar. When, when you're going through a tough time and you're doubting, uh, God gives you a little thing. It uh, sounds a little familiar. It seems really familiar. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to people, It's the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say this, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, but they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, I want you to just, just have this in your mind. The exact same scenario when Peter was called, then he had missed opportunities, mistakes, but there was restorative power. God recreates the same scenario, and then Peter ends up being the keynote speaker at Pentecost. 
You read the rest of the chapter. I'm sure Jesus put his arm around him. They're walking and said, Peter, do you love me? He says, yeah, I love you. He said, then feed my lamb. Walk a little further. He said, do you love me? He said, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Well, then feed my lambs. Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? The Bible says Peter was hurt by that. Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. But it's powerful because he denied Jesus three times. And three times Jesus asked him. It was a sense of restoration. It was a sense of you're healed, you're restored, you're complete. And then Peter becomes the keynote speaker at Pentecost, and God uses him to reach the known world. Restorative power. Peter could have missed that by thinking about his missed opportunities. Peter could have, could have, could have been dwelling on his mistakes so much that he wouldn't have received the grace of God. Hear the word of the Lord. God wants us to really believe his grace, wants to believe who Jesus is, and let him heal our hearts and our minds from the stuff. Quit beating yourself. Please, I beg you as a brother, just quit hammering yourself. Quit condemning yourself. Quit dwelling so much on the past that it paralyzes you. Keeps you from moving forward. God wants you to run unhindered. Run, lay off the weight. Encounter his weight of glory so that you can run. Say amen, church. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Praise the Lord.